Today we're going to focus on uh, what the Bible says about the worth of every human life this morning. So we're going to be in a couple different texts this morning, um, a little different than what we normally do here. Um, But uh, our first text is going to be in Genesis chapter 1, and as you work really hard to find that page in your Bible, I want to talk to you about an experience in my life that helped me to truly understand what it means that every life has value and worth. Uh, Many of you know uh, in college and in seminary, I worked at a summer camp. I've told some fun stories. I've saved some of the more bizarre ones for later sermons. But one of the nice things about our camp was it was actually a pretty large camp, Uh, one of the larger Christian camps in the country. And because of that, we had resources that other camps did not have. And one of those was that we were able to serve campers with really any physical or mental disability. There was a quite significant, uh, what we called our Campers with Special Needs uh, program. Uh, They were able to have their own buildings for housing, Uh, As you can imagine, uh, severe uh, disabilities, people that have those disabilities oftentimes need their own place to stay and their own counselor. And so we were able to have staff, one-on-one staff and one-on-one housing and golf carts and programs for people. And so that we were able to take people with very severe and significant needs Part of that interaction that I got to have with these kids and with their parents, their parents would come to our camp and say, this is my only week off this whole year. And to see how much they loved their child and how much love their child gave. What it gave me as an experience, as a real, not from a book, not from an article, but from real life experience was that these campers who had, in some cases, very severe medical issues, many of whom could not talk or communicate in any way we would recognize, but as I actually interacted with them, as I actually got to be with them in these activities, and, and doing activities, we had one that was called the flying squirrel where you had a rope and a pulley and the cabin ran one way and the kid ran the other way. And so these kids who confined to wheelchairs were shot up into the air on this pulley system. It allowed me to experience in a real way that every life is valuable. That every person, no matter their circumstances, is made in the image of God. The person whose ability to function was so impaired and who had so many health challenges was created and loved by God and therefore I needed to love and value them. And so today as we recognize and celebrate the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, We're going to look at three different Bible passages that speak about that intrinsic value and worth of every human person. So let's look again, as I said, Genesis chapter 1, if you need to use the table of contents to find that, um, I'll give you some time to turn some pages there. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, familiar words to most of us. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The first and most basic thing that we need to see in this passage is the undeniable truth that people were created. We do not believe that people were a random mutation of cells, but that God himself created people. 
Secondly, we need to see that people were created differently than the other parts of creation. Nothing else in all of creation is made, to use the words of verse 26, in our image after our likeness. This is repeated in verse 27 as people being created in the image of God. And we're even told in verse 27 that this is for male and female. And this even tells us a few things. One, that God created two sexes. God created male and female. But also by referencing both, it includes everyone. Everyone is made in the image of God, male and female. And this means many things, but for our purposes today, I want us to understand that the image of God means that people were made to reflect God in a way that no other creation was. That we are especially made to be God's representative, his ambassadors in his world. We are to be God's hands and feet in his creation, and we mimic his own existence in our reason, emotion, pursuit of his holiness, and many other ways. But there are implications that arise out of our being made in the image of God. Explicitly here, we have taken care of God's creation, but more specific to our study today is that this is what grounds our belief in the dignity and worth of all human life. I want to read to you from our denomination's website Quote, our creation and the image of God gives dignity to human life. This image, perfect in Jesus the God-man, is not something human beings do, but rather it is who they are. For this reason, all human beings, each and every one, is created in the image of God and therefore has innate worth and dignity. In that quotation, notice the emphasis on all people and that each has, quote, innate worth and and dignity. This is in contrast to what I would see as the default approach of our world. This is in contrast to what I see in our society as a functional worth that people have. I think of it this way, is that our worth is based on what we contribute to society or our performance as a person. This is seen most clearly in the work of Peter Singer, who defines a person as being able to be rational or self-conscious. In that sense, an unborn baby would not be a full life, but rather a potential human. The elderly might face euthanasia because they are no longer producing as they were, and the disabled are not fully valued because of their special needs and lack of ability. That is the default position of our world. But that is not what we believe. We believe that all people, regardless of their ability or contribution, are fully valued as people because they were made in the image of God. And since we are always made in the image of God, we are always valued and worthy of dignity. This dignity is a gift from God himself. I appreciate this quote that I found from Dr. R.C. Sproul. He says this, I become significant when God scoops up that dust and molds it into a human being and breathes into it the breath of life and says, this creature is made in my image. God assigns eternal significance to temporal creatures. I don't have anything in me that would demand that God would treat me with eternal significance. I have eternal significance and eternal worth because God gives it to me. And not only does he give it to me, but he gives it to every human being. We see very clearly in the opening chapter of Genesis that all people are created by God and therefore have innate value and worth. The next passage I want to look at this morning is 2 Samuel chapter 9. 
And I want us to see in this chapter, it may be a story you're not that familiar with, but I think it speaks to one of the implications of what it means to value people, to see their innate worth. What I want us to see in this story is of a kindness that is not earned. A kindness that is shown regardless of getting anything back. Because if all people are made in the image of God, then we don't love people because they love us back or we can get something from them. We love them because they are made in the image of God. So I'm quickly going to move through the story here, again, for issues of time. But let's look at verses 1 to 4 of 2 Samuel chapter 9. David is solidifying his rule over the kingdom of Israel. And he says this in verse 1, And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? But Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. This chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 9, shows that a part of David consolidating his power as king desires to show kindness to anyone left of the house of Saul. Remember, Saul was the king before David. Now, this is strange because you wouldn't normally show kindness to the descendants of the previous king, which we will get to in a second. But it is also understandable because it is because of his friendship with the son of Saul, Jonathan. We are told that there is one person left, a man named Mephibosheth, who is described as being crippled in his feet. And this was as a result of an accident when he was five years old, which you can read about in 2 Samuel chapter 4. Now in the next verses, in verses 5 to 8, David calls Mephibosheth. Now again, if you are a son of the previous king and the current king is calling you to the palace, you're going to be a little afraid. So let's look at that. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar, and Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? So Mephibosheth, excuse me, Mephibosheth, just be, just be thankful you don't have to keep saying that name, okay, is brought to David and he is understandably afraid. He is a descendant of Saul, the former king, a king who greatly mistreated David, the current king. But David, surprisingly, especially to Mephibosheth, declares that Mephibosheth should receive the land of Saul and that he will eat at David's table like one of David's sons. Let's see that David keeps this promise. Because again, even up to this point, you could be thinking, boy, this is a trap. I want to get one of the last descendants of Saul, and maybe that's what Mephibosheth is thinking. But let's look at verses 9 to 13. Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, 
shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. These verses record that David kept his promise. This is not some political trick, but rather, again, verse 13 So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. To understand this text, I want you to understand the two reasons that David should not show this kindness to Mephibosheth. Number one, that Mephibosheth is still alive gives opponents of David another heir to Saul's throne. Again, we need to take ourselves back into that ancient world where if you wanted a military coup, having a descendant of the former king would be a great thing to have. In a sense, David is putting himself in danger by being in the same room with a descendant of the former king. Now, that's a little hard for us to understand because we don't live in that world, but you need to see that David is putting his throne at risk in allowing Mephibosheth to even live. As a descendant of Saul, he could try to claim Saul's throne back and be a political threat to King David's kingship. But the other reason that he should not show this kindness to Mephibosheth is that his disabilities would prevent him from being highly valuable to David. I don't think it's an accident how many times Mephibosheth's disability is referenced. I think it underscores that David gained nothing from this relationship. The benefit of having a descendant of a former king because of their ability to be another warrior or some function like that does not exist. And I think it underscores that David showed kindness even though there was no tangible benefit to him. David's kindness to Mephibosheth is an example to us. Because we believe that all people have worth being made in the image of God, we can love them even though we don't necessarily get anything from them. Too often in our societies and even in our own lives, our love is transactional. I love you because I can get something from you. But David shows us an example of a better way to love. We do not love because of what we get. We love because all people have worth regardless of what they can do for us. I have had examples in my own life where I'm interacting with an unbeliever. And one of the things they'll say to me is this, your love is different because you're not trying to get anything out of me. Why? Because we believe that we love people because they are made in the image of God. That is the foundation of our love, not what can I get from you. We love the unborn, we love the elderly, we love those with challenges and disabilities because they are made in the image of God and God has called us to love them. We are able to love all our neighbors because we know that God has created them all. So as we think of the sanctity of human life, this is one of the ways that understanding that all people are made in the image of God can change your life. It gives you a solid foundation upon which you can love in a different, 
in a better way. I won't love my neighbor if I don't value their life. I won't love those that I can't gain anything from or who don't function in society the way that everybody else does. We love all people because all people have great and infinite value and worth as being created in the image of God. The last text I want to look at this morning comes from Luke chapter 1. This is a great story as a part of the birth of Jesus narrative. Uh, For all of you with grandkids or uh, kids who are having kids, this is the first mommy play date in the Bible. Let me read you beginning in verse 39 to 41. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary, the mother of Jesus, goes and visits her relative Elizabeth, who is pregnant with baby John the Baptist. And in verse 30, 41, excuse me, verse 41, we read this. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And at that very moment, the second part of verse 41 tells us that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and begins to declare the word of the Lord to Mary. Again, there's a lot there. I encourage you to go back and read this. Uh, later this week, but for our purposes today, I want to look specifically at verse 44. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. This is a wonderful picture where we are told in the scriptures what an unborn baby did and felt. And again, for our purposes today, what we see in this detail is that there is no mistaking that this is a life. An unborn baby is not a potential human being. There is no question that this unborn baby is a full person with full value and full worth as a person made in the image of God. The baby heard The baby leaped, and he leaped with joy. Again, it cannot be denied. One of the obvious implications of this that we need to highlight at times like this when we celebrate sanctity of human life is that we must always work to limit and end, ultimately, the practice of abortion in our world. As of Saturday, uh, Saturday the 16th at 10.40 a.m., according to the website Worldometers, which keeps a running count of this, already this year, 16 days into the year, there were 1.8 million abortions worldwide. The World Health Organization estimates every year that there are about 40 to 50 million abortions worldwide. God's people must be a part of change that helps women in crisis who feel that their only solution is an abortion and to change laws surrounding abortion. It cannot be denied that abortion is ending the life of a person made in the image of God. An unborn baby is not a random clump of cells. It is a full life made in the image of God. One of the interesting things about this part of our theology 
is that it only grows stronger as technology and science grows. That what we see in special revelation in the Bible is supported by the general revelation of God's creation. I want you to think of all the different technology. And especially for you, you remember the lack of this technology. Even, even I do, and I'll get to that in a second. I want you to think of how far ultrasound technology has come in our lifetimes. How much even over the last couple of decades. Now being able to do 3D imaging in the womb you cannot deny that that is a baby human. The growth of science so that we can determine with complete consensus that an unborn child can experience pain at 20 weeks. I want you to think just about the fact that we can say with certainty that we know how to test an unborn baby to see if they feel pain (laughs) and that we can determine it's 20 weeks. We see this in our world. Recently, this last year, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, Democrat from Hawaii, tried to introduce legislation limiting abortion to 20 weeks. Why? Because it is undeniable that that is true. Another example that I learned as a father, and I don't think this was available with every of even our kids. So between Lucy and Adam, this changed. But that as early as 10 weeks, we can detect a baby's distinct DNA from the mother's with a simple blood test. One of the interesting parts of this part of our theology is that it is undeniably supported by science and technology. God has given us the gift of science to demonstrate to ourselves and to others that truth is found in the Bible is backed up by the natural world in undeniable ways. And I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but it's especially in this area where I have seen positive, edifying conversations happen and incremental change happen with people's views towards the unborn. And there is opportunity here to speak with unbelievers about what the Bible says because of what science also says. A couple thoughts as we close up this morning. Number one, we believe that all life is valuable. We believe that all people have innate value and worth. It doesn't matter how young or old you are. It doesn't matter your abilities or lack thereof. From the first moments of life to the last, we value and defend life. Secondly, one of the implications of this is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Because God has made all people in his image, we love our neighbors as ourselves. Again, another quote from R.C. Sproul. He says this, That's why in the Bible the the great commandment not only deals with our relationship with God, but our relationship with human beings. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Because God has endowed every human creature with value. We do not love because we will get something out of it. We love because God has endowed every human creature with value. This belief of the value of human life must demonstrate itself in service and love for others. Three, we should do whatever we can to limit and bring an end to abortion. This begins with prayer. It includes the political avenues available to us. We can be encouraged with instances like the state of Missouri, which had their last abortion clinic recently closed. 
As I mentioned before, it also includes having constructive personal conversations with our friends, family, and neighbors. And in saying that, I want to give you hope that these conversations are possible. When we lovingly engage with others and when we engage with both what the scriptures say and what science tells us, I have seen people take incremental steps towards the truth. For we should do whatever we can to support other life issues. There are many issues that come under the umbrella of life. Care for the poor, the elderly, foster care and adoption, to name a few. A couple years ago, we started the process to do foster care, but for a couple of reasons, some out of our control, it didn't work out. I want to give you three takeaways from that experience. Number one, there is a great need for foster parents and support for foster parents. Secondly, the church is leading the way in caring for kids. While it is definitely a program run by the government, and that is easily seen, it was easy to tell that so many of the people involved identified as Christian. And in some sense, I think that's the dirty secret that doesn't get told enough. That Christians really are leading the way in foster care and adoption. And the third thing that I saw was that one of the specific problems that exist is that adoption is so expensive. There is no one way to engage in upholding and protecting life. And I want you to ask yourself this. I want you to be in prayer about how God would give you an opportunity to serve in this way specifically. And finally, as was mentioned earlier in the service, one of the most important things Christians can do to support life is to support with both finances and service places like the pregnancy care clinic. It is undeniable that places like the pregnancy care clinic are the front line of so much work to defend life in our world. So would you consider how you as an individual might support Pregnancy Care Clinic? As Dave mentioned, we give financial support as a church, but is God calling you to give as an individual? In addition to financial support, organizations like PCC need other forms of service. Maybe God is putting it on your heart this week. What if God is calling you to contact PCC to volunteer in some way? I'll close here. Today we recognize and celebrate the life of every human being, not because of what they can do or contribute to society, but because they are made in the image of God. May we show love and dignity to all people. May we stand up for those who do not have the power to stand. May the church lead the way in fighting for the care of all people. May we love God by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word that speaks so clearly to us about the value of every human life. That we would love and serve one another, that we would stand up for those who need defending. That we would recognize that every life is a gift from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.